seated. We are delighted to have you with us today for the second session of our creation conference. Uh, Brother Derek Isaacs brought to us a message in Sunday school warning us of the dangers of Darwinism, how it affects practical living. As I said a few moments ago, what you really believe will affect the way in which you live. And those who believe in evolution, though they might wish to deny it, as some in the presentation this morning, Richard Dawkins uh, believes in evolution as a scientific theory, but he does not want evolution to be what uh, maintains the ethics and morals of our society. He realizes it's danger, because if we're only animals, if there is no God, if men are at different stages of evolution, then really it doesn't matter what you do, because there is no one to whom you will give an account. And thus we find, as he gave great illustration this morning, the euthanasia programs that Hitler instituted, the way in which Margaret Sanger, who based her theory of killing babies through abortion on evolution, felt perfectly justified in so doing, eliminating the imbeciles of the human race. Very sad when you start with that philosophy, you cannot come to the right conclusions. And as he so wonderfully pointed out, of having the fruit of the Spirit and having a compassionate spirit and having a Samaritan heart where you give yourself for someone else instead it's survival of the fittest. Excellent presentation. The foundation of the message behind the Battle for Beginnings which he's going to share with us now and then later this evening he will be sharing dinosaurs and dragons. Bring your friends, especially your unsaved friends tonight it is a tremendous challenge as we see the evidence for men and dinosaurs living at the same time, blowing holes in the so-called theory 
of evolution. Brother Isaac has produced a number of books. The one that has much of the information that you heard earlier today, The Extinction of Evolution. Tonight we're going to be hearing about dragons or dinosaurs. He's got a book on that. He's also produced a film on that. And also the Creation Answers book, 60 questions that most frequently are asked by unbelievers concerning the issue of creation. This book is also out on the back table. We invite you after the service to come out and look at the resources that are available. Tonight after the presentation there will also be a question and answer session whereby you can ask questions that perhaps are not in the book. So uh, we invite you back this evening. Hope that you can come. Uh, very important especially for young people, those of you who are parents with children. Please bring your children back tonight. Uh, it's really an exciting presentation for young people, uh, the one tonight. But now it is with great pleasure that we uh, introduce to you Brother Derek Isaacs, Creation Ministries International out of Atlanta, Georgia. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is so wonderful to be here. I had a great time fellowshipping with uh, some of the youth last night. We had an epic game of volleyball and uh, <laughs> absolutely a lot, a lot of fun. Well, uh, I am with Creation Ministries International, and for those of you who do not know us, we've been around for 32 years. We have offices in seven countries. Um, our staff consists primarily of scientists, uh, theologians, and laymen, and we are all focused primarily on defending really Genesis, that very first book of the Bible, against the secular intrusion of the theory of evolution. Now we do that by providing the church, you guys, with information. Now, our flagship production is Creation Magazine. We have subscribers in 110 countries. So God really has blessed this ministry. It is an incredible magazine, absolutely, that demonstrates using science, reason, logic in the Bible, okay, that everything that we see in nature testifies to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Creator. Now, also, our website is a huge part of our ministry. And I, I, would, I really encourage all of you to go to it. If, um, it is found at creation.com. So go ahead and say that with me so you remember it. Creation.com. All right. It's not, it's not hard to remember. Uh, on this website, we have over 7,500 articles freely accessible to anyone at any time. Practically any question that you may have on creation and evolution, you're going to find on this website. It's like 32 years worth of ministry. Uh, we do have little cards in the back, so if you think you'll forget the website, just pick one of those up in the back. Um, when you would go to the website, it'll look something like this, and, and if you just want to search topics, there's a topic um, tab, and there, it drops down to a Q&A, and everything is arranged by subject matter. So you simply click it, and you got it. It's a biblical war chest of, about, of apologetic material. Now, one part of our ministry is receiving, is we respond to questions that we often receive through our website. Um, and, and there are challenges. Now, you guys may remember Steve Irwin, right, the famous crocodile hunter. Absolutely beloved figure. I mean, I loved watching him. And, uh, you know, a few years back, he was tragically killed when a stingray speared him through the heart and he died. You know, a lot of us remember that. Now, our ministry got a lot of questions, and, and the overall tone of that question was, if God is a loving God then why did he create stingrays that kill people? Now, it's not really an unfair question for an unbeliever to ask, but how would you respond to an unbeliever if you were challenged like that out in the street while you're just with your friends or neighbors? You see, Dr. David Ketchville, one of our research scientists, he wrote an article called Stingray of Death, and he explained in that article that the reason we have sin, and we have death and suffering and pain, is because of the original sin of Adam, the curse of sin that came all the way at the beginning. And then that article became an evangelical tool for the church, for you guys, because we sent it out through a ministry called Infobytes. It's, an e, it's an, a free email newsletter that we send out. And many people took that article and they forwarded it on to unsaved family members and friends. That's what we're about. We want to use this information to help you reach the lost, the people that you care about in your life, that you want to see come to Jesus Christ. These articles that we write can help you do that. That's our hope for them, at least. 
Um, if you're interested in getting the, the info bytes, which is a free email newsletter, we're going to pass right now around um, just some sign-up sheets. It's completely free. They come about they come out about once a week. Just simply on this on the sign-up sheets, just drop your your name and your information into the fields. Um, one of the things that these info bytes um, help you do is stay relevant with the information that is out there today. Now, one of the things that we have to really battle against is this theory of evolution. Now, when I was 18 years old, all right, I was in my first I was in my first biology class at university, and I remember sitting in this big kind of auditorium. I was just one of many, well over 100 kids, right in the middle, and my professor stood up, put his hands up in the air and said, 99% of the world believes evolution is a fact. Right out of the gate. Now what he meant by that is that 3.5 billion years ago, they believe that this little cell out of some primordial soup or pond scum willed itself into existence just accidentally or something. And now you have a living creature all by accident. And then somehow that cell, through millions and billions of years, added information to itself and it became fish and fishies filled the ocean. Then fish, who cannot survive out of water very long, decided to try to survive out of water and it just worked. That's what we're told to believe. Those fish turn into reptiles, reptiles turn into mammals, mammals supposedly turn into ape men, ape men then turn into modern man. That goes to the theory of evolution. Now. Some mammals, we're told, were not so happy being on the ground, so they jumped back into the oceans, and they started swimming so much that their lungs evidently bored a hole through their back, and they gave themselves blowholes. And that is where the whales would have come from, according to the theory of evolution. Now, at that age, when I was 18, I didn't believe in evolution. I, I just couldn't, I, I thought it was preposterous that all the complex mechanisms that we see in nature in our body just arose by random chaos and chance and accident. I just didn't believe it. You know, and I started to think that day in class that if evolution were true, if it really was the story of our origins, then shouldn't studying biology for an entire semester simply reveal that answer? Shouldn't the truth reveal itself once we view the data? You see, the, I thought the professor got the cart in front of the horse because he turned what I thought should have been an ending conclusion into a starting presupposition. He said, believe this first, now let's view the evidence. And it wasn't open for discussion, debate, or inquiry. He wanted us to understand biology through the eyes of evolution. It was believe evolution first, then let's view the evidence. And it could not be challenged or debated. Well, I decided to confront the professor with the indignation of an 18-year-old male. You wonder how that went. A lot of the women are like, oh boy, <laughs> and you're right. I wanted to challenge him on that 99% figure. So I went down to him after class and I said, Professor, you said that 99% of the world believes evolution is fact. And he just, mm, yeah. I said, where's your source for that? And he looked at me and I repeated the question. And he looked at me and he just smirked and laughed and said, oh, you must be a Christian. Now that kind of took me off guard because I didn't say anything about the Bible. I didn't bring up Christianity or God. I simply asked a scientist for his source and evidently that was too great of a burden for him to bear. And he started laughing and said, so you actually think that all the birds are exact, were made exactly as they are now? And he was just laughing at me when he said it. Now, I didn't know what to say to that when I was 18 years old. Is that true? Is that wrong? Is that right? Is that what Christians believe? Is that stupid? Why was this guy just laughing at me? And I had no idea. The conversation just ended that way. He went his direction and I went mine. Now the tragedy of that day, and it is a tragedy, my friends, is that there is a very real answer to his question about the different kinds of birds, or what is called speciation. But I was unable to give it. Now, on his challenge of variation and speciation, you know, where all the species come from, biblical creationists believe that God created with advanced design. Out of two humans, Adam and Eve, all, every, all the humans in the world descend. And we all have a little bit of variation in us, right? We're all a little bit different. Out of two cats, all the cats descend. Out of two dogs, all the dogs descend. So it, if you can see this, all of these dogs and everything came out of just two original dogs.
But this is not evolution. This change is not evolution because it starts out with an advanced design with all that genetic information perfectly intact. And then it descends with variation. There are genetic limits to the kind of change that can happen. A dog will always produce some kind of dog. A human will always give birth to a human. Now, I know some parents will look at their children and say, that's not a human. No, but it is. <laughs> Your child is human. All right? A pine tree cannot produce a pineapple, and a jellyfish will not give birth to a hog. It doesn't, does not matter how much time and generations are given to it. The genetic information is simply not there. There are limits. And, and everything in nature reproduces according to their own kind. Now, ten times in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible does say that God created kinds to reproduce according to their own kind. That is confirmed what we see in nature. So biblical creationists believe that there is an advanced design that descends with variation within kinds. That's where all the variety comes from. It's a pretty easy answer. Now, the biblical phrase found in Genesis that creatures and plants would reproduce according to their own kind is just one contradiction the Bible has with evolution. Because evolution teaches, in contrast, that out of the origins of slime, over billions of years, life ascended, if you will, accidentally building itself up into all the species we see today. It is a different direction of change, a different method of change. So as advanced design, descending downward, versus origins of slime, things accidentally building themselves up. But which one aligns better with the evidence? It is our biblical model of advanced design. Because what we witness is that offspring is always an equal or lesser version of the parent, all the time. And that there are predetermined genetic limits to how much change can happen. And mutations to the genetic code, to our DNA, cannot expand or create novel information, which is the thrust of evolutionary theory. Mutations, according to evolution, must be able to create brand new information that has never, ever existed before. But it doesn't do that. Dr. Lee Spetner said this, All mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not to increase it. The evidence fits advanced design and stands against the idea that mutations can build up our genes and make complex organisms out of origins of slime. The Bible easily wins this one. But my church, my church where I grew up as a child, did not take seriously equipping its youth to withstand the secular attacks. And that is why I am so thankful that your church leadership has had the discernment to know that this kind of ministry is so important. Because it was not acceptable that I could not fashion any answer to that scoffer who was posing as a professor. According to 1 Peter 3.15, we should always be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, my friends... Is that a suggestion for us? No, it's not. Being prepared is not an option. The word answer in this passage is from the Greek word apologia. From this word we derive the English word apologetics. Now apologetics does not mean to be sorry or, or you know, to apologize. Quite the contrary, it means to make an impassioned case for something that you know to be true. And in this day and age, we need to get back to that. Because the body of Christ, as the body of Christ, we need to help each other bond together to make that impassioned case. Because too many of our young people do not know the strength of which this Bible stands upon. They don't know it. And we need to help them understand that. Now, I did not receive my call into ministry until years, years, years later. But I can see now the divine providence of having, of, that the Lord took in having me interact with that professor that day in class. Because the Lord gave me a context to understand this. And I'll read it for you. We received a letter from a youth worker in Australia. And this is what she said. She wrote, I used to beat my head against a wall, wondering why we lost all our young people at about age 16. But then she discovered age 16, year 10, is when they teach evolution in depth in science. 
Some of the teachers actually identify the Christian students and make a special point of explaining the differences and difficulties in reconciling Genesis and the facts of evolution. It's no wonder we lost them. I come near tears just thinking about it. My friends, the younger generations, your children and your grandchildren, are facing a systematic attack on our Lord Jesus Christ and on Christianity. And it is coming through secular academia. According to the Southern Baptist Survey, 88% of children raised in evangelical homes now leave the church at the age of 18, never to return. In America, this exit is corresponding to the first year in college, usually, when a child is actively challenged by secular academia just like I was. Now, I'm here today in an effort that that 88% does not happen here. Now, these figures are, they're an ominous warning. I understand that. But gloom and doom is not my message today. We are here because we have a history of hope through Jesus Christ. Over the last 2,000 years, secular forces have attacked the church with everything that they've got. But guess what? The church still stands. We still gather as the saints. We still proclaim his name. Jesus Christ has proven has proven that he is the anvil that has worn out every hammer. And that is consistent with what the Bible told us would happen. Matthew 16, 18 says, Upon this rock, and this is Jesus speaking, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Alright? And th- But, this is what we also know from the Bible. It also teaches this. Revelation 3.16 So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will skew thee out of thy mouth. You see, for churches to survive the secular advances, they must be the uncompromising real church that does not bend and stands alone on the authority of Scripture. Period. To protect our families from the secular intrusion, zeal alone will not do it. You see, too often we live within a broader modern church that treats Genesis just like it's a secondary issue. It's become an a la carte portion of a biblical menu that you can either take or leave to whatever appetite pushes you. And you know, I am often asked when I'm out in ministry, I'm often asked, does it even matter if God created everything in his six literal days? Maybe, why couldn't he have used six, you know, periods of time, millions and billions of years to create us? I'm I'm asked, is it really that big of a compromise to not stick to a literal Genesis? Shouldn't we just focus on Jesus? Now, I respond to those individuals that I agree with them that Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, is all that matters. And it is because of our Lord Jesus that we must offer a stiff, unyielding rebuttal to the theory of evolution, and this is why. The Bible teaches us, and we read this this morning, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That is the word of God. Adam was the very first of his kind, and it is not just Genesis that speaks to this. In the New Testament, Luke chapter 3, the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ traces all the way back to Adam, this first man, and then straight to God. There is no room for millions and millions of years or a pre-human ape-like ancestor in the biblical timeline. And if Genesis is just a parable or a moral story, as some even in this community would want you to believe, then at what point does the genealogy of Jesus Christ become just a parable or moral story? At what point do the patriarchs before him and their genealogy just become a parable or moral story? You see, once the Genesis is compromised, then the Gospel of Luke, Jesus Christ, and all of the people before him, and the patriarchs in those genealogies are also compromised. And if one believes the universe is millions and billions of years old, then Jesus, in Mark chapter 10, was completely wrong when he said, from the beginning, God made them male and female. From the beginning, God made them Adam and Eve. For the genealogies of the Bible, which are remarkably detailed, and I'll get into more of that tonight, would lead us to an understanding that Adam and Eve lived only about 6,000 years ago. That was the beginning, according to the Bible. But according to evolutionary ideas, the beginning was about 14 billion years ago. 
You see, the theory of evolution radically changes man's beginnings, origins, and history. It radically departs from the history given to us in our Bible. So when professors are telling young people that the history of evolution is a fact, what they are saying dogmatically is that the history of your Bible is a lie. Because according to evolution, after billions of years, our recent ancestors allegedly came to, into existence as this, as this, into these ape-like creatures as this imaginative sketch is meant to represent. Now, notice the skull and, cross, the, uh, skull and crossbones graphic on top of each of these pictures. This is because evolution has these creatures dying out in mass numbers as they advance toward the first human. Years of death, disease, and suffering led up to the first human according to evolution. Death is a propagator of life in their model. Think about that. Evolution actually immunizes us from the horror and pain of death. But death is an ever-present reminder of the curse of sin. Because remember, for those, of, for those people that die without knowing our Lord Jesus Christ, death begins the eternal tragedy for them in hell. Yet evolution teaches what? That death is just a positive step forward in the advancing progression of life forms. Survival of the fittest. Think of how sinister of a lie that is. According to the Bible, there is also a very important precursor that led to death. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Only after the original sin of Adam did man and animal kind suffer death, disease, and pain. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But it was not just man and animals that suffer. The creation, nature, suffers now. Romans 8.22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Tornadoes, earthquakes, flood, famine, volcanoes, all the result of the curse of sin in a broken world because of the curse of sin of Adam. Romans 5.12 states, Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. There is a cause and effect that we should not forget, and it is thematic throughout the whole Bible. Death, sin caused death. But as we look at this evolutionary make-believe picture up here, we also see what? That there is no real authentic Adam who is made directly out of the dirt of the ground and life breathed into him in the image of God. There is no Adam here. And this is where the other shoe drops, my friends. Because it was the one man, Adam, who sinned and brought death into the world. But if there is no literal Adam, then there is no literal original sin that he could have committed. And if there is no sin, there can't be a punishment or a damnation for that sin. And if there is no damnation, then why do we need to seek for salvation? And if we don't need to seek for salvation, why in the world do we ever need a Savior? You see, that, my friends, is the deception of evolution. It is the most sophisticated attack on Jesus Christ I have ever seen because it eliminates him. His life, his meaning, his message, his purpose, why he came without ever mentioning his name. And without a reliable messianic Christ, Messiah, the God of the Bible ceases to exist. So yes, everything our ministry does is for and about our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it is no wonder then with evolution trying to erase the reliability of the God of the Bible that one of the world's leading evolutionists, Richard Dawkins, he's like the, he's like the high priest of evolution, if you will, he said this about Darwinian evolution. He says, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. You see, my friends, evolution is empowering a new wave of atheists. And because they think they're intellectually enabled now. And they're becoming very brazen about their faith. I showed this this morning in Sunday school. In January of 2009, this advertisement ran on the side of buses in London. It says, there's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. My friends, do not believe that evolution is science. It is about the battle of our beginnings, where we come from, 
and therefore the battle of our end, where we are going. That is why evolution is on our turf, church. It is our mandate, our charge to respond and effectively reach these people with the good news of Jesus Christ. It is this church's responsibility to reach the community here who believes in evolution for the good news, with the good news of Jesus Christ. Did you know there is even a movement to form a global religion that celebrates humanism and evolution? On February 12th, Darwin's birthday, this religion celebrates what's called Darwin Day. They also call it Global Celebration Day. And they are lobbying right now in the United States to make this a federal holiday. They're trying to make it their own Christmas. Now, it is a religion that puts humanity at the top of existence. But not only that, it makes man the authority of man. For if there is no God, then who are we accountable to? Who determines what is right or wrong, moral or sinful? You see what kind of fruit this godless religion could produce. And I went over that a little bit in Sunday school. Now, my first book is called The Extinction of Evolution. It was written because I could not get one thought out of my head. And that is, if evolution were true, then how now shall we live? In this little black book, what that really means is that we, I dove into the social reality of the outcome of evolutionary thought. Meaning, if we apply evolutionary ideas consistently into every aspect of our life, what would that belief produce? It is really shocking. What I concluded is that when someone erases God completely, and they become their own master based on evolution and survival of the fittest, that evolutionary worldview manifests itself as the embracement of all sin. It's a devastating outcome. And I know the accusation I make, a lot of people will go, wow, you can't make that accusation. But do you know what is interesting? In February of 2010, the following year after my book was published, a secular science magazine essentially reached the same conclusions that I did. This is the front cover of it. And I'll read it if you can't see it. It's Focus Magazine, and it says, Born to Sin. And underneath that, it says, Why Nature Wants You to Be Bad. Now, by the way, this is not a conviction, my friends. They're not trying to convict us. This is a celebration of sin. Then written on the apple are the words lust, envy, wrath, greed, pride, and gluttony. You see, there are evolutionary reasons to why acts of sin are no longer bad, but rather acts of sin are evolutionary attributes that aided the progression from monkeys to man. Thievery, murder, or what we would rightfully label sexually committed crimes were merely tools to help the strongest man propagate its DNA and therefore evolve. We learned a lot about that in Sunday school this morning. Can you see the work of the adversary in this? Evolution takes sin and makes it good. Now, there are people who believe in what is called theistic evolution, which is God used evolution to create us. And to those people I say respectfully, I do not think you have been apprised of the implications of that assertion. To explain it further, Charles Darwin wrote about survival of the fittest, which is another way of saying what? Death to the weakest. They mean the same thing. Whereas Christianity is about Jesus Christ, who is the fit, coming down and dying for the unfit. And that's you and me. Christianity and evolution are mutually exclusive from each other. The basic doctrines combat each other. Now, there are other ideas that compromise a literal reading of Genesis, of those six-day creation and rest on the seventh, like the gap theory, the day-age theory, the framework hypothesis, progressive creation, um, some of you may have heard of some of these. All of those theories, though, that try to compromise Genesis use the evolutionary model of millions and billions of years. They assume that. But here's, here's the problem. That means that they believe millions and billions of years of creatures being born, then dying, before Adam was even created. But how could all that life and death occur in the Garden of Eden before the Garden of Eden when God said everything was good? You see, according to those theories, all of that death happened before the curse of sin that Adam committed. But according to the Bible, death only came after sin. Do you see the problem? Those theories actually blame God for the death and suffering because he just made it that way. 
So whether they know it or not, whether they have completely thought that through, what they — what they are proclaiming is that they're — they're actually attacking the idea of God being a good and loving God, because he made pain and suffering just a natural way of this — of this world, instead of Adam's sin being responsible for the pain and suffering. Now, speaking of sin, and more precisely, the accountability of sin, let's look at what Charles Darwin, the founder of evolutionary thought, said about sin, judgment, and accountability. He wrote, I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that the one — that the men who do not believe, and, that would, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished. And that is a damnable doctrine. Wow. Do you see anything about science in this statement? No. You see a basic rejection of Christianity based on being accountable to an authoritative God. And here he calls the saving grace of Jesus Christ a damnable doctrine. Is it any surprise then that his own theory tries to erase the meaning of Jesus Christ and it makes acts of sin a positive thing in humanity's progression instead of sin being something that we are accountable for to an authoritative and powerful God? Now, if someone willfully rejects the Bible, which he obviously did, Think about how much of humanity that he would be able to redefine at that point. You see, the Bible gives us a complete view of our past history, of the entire universe. And so much of our meaning is found immediately in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. We are told where we came from, why we are here, why we even wear clothing. Animals don't, unless we stick it on them. How long we've been in existence, why we have marriage and why there is death, and why we need a Savior. Yet if someone rejects the Bible, as Darwin did, think about all of those things that we just mentioned that can now be redefined without God in them. This is why Harvard professor and evolutionist E.O. Wilson, another big voice for evolution, he said this about evolution. If a moving automobile were an organism, Functional biology would explain how it is constructed and operates, while evolutionary biology would reconstruct its origin and history, how it came to be made and its journey thus far. Do you see that evolutionary biology is not operational or functional biology? It's not even real science. It's about history and reconstructing where we came from meaning giving us new ideas of why we are the way we are. Observational science is experimental science. We get mobile phones, medicines, technology from this. But historical science, or forensic science, some people call it, is about reconstructing the past, which was not observed by those today, and is certainly not repeatable. But for Bible believers, us, we do not need to reconstruct where we came from because Genesis gives that to us. God was very gracious in telling us exactly who we are, why we are here, and where we are going. However, that does not work for those who reject God. So Darwin created a new history of humanity that he published uh, in 1859. You know it as the origin of species, but schools often leave off Darwin's full title, which is by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Favored races, that's kind of a shocking phrase. Darwin, early in his life, he traveled quite a bit. He saw people from different continents and countries, and he built a hierarchy of which races were the most evolved. And this morning in Sunday school, we really went into that. Um, I'm going to give you just one example or a couple examples of what people did in the name of evolution way back when, when they first adopted it at basically the turn of the century. A man named Odabingo was literally taken from the Congo and put in display in the Bronx Zoo in 1906. He was displayed as the evolutionary missing link. Aborigines in Australia were dug up out of graves and stuffed to be museum exhibits. My friends, this is just evil. This is just evil. Now, fortunately, modern science has completely discredited the idea that some races are more advanced than others. 
Francis Collin, who was a leader in the Human Genome Project, who mapped our DNA, he said this, and he's an evolutionist, and he said, another striking feature of the human genome comes from the comparison of different members of our own species. At the DNA level, we are all 99.9% .9 identical. He went on to say, thus, by DNA analysis, we humans are truly part of just one family. This remarkably low genetic diversity distinguishes us from most other species on the planet. Now, for some of you, some of you who weren't here this morning, I went over a little bit of this. Why was it such a striking and remarkable feature for evolutionists that humans have such a low level of genetic diversity? It is this. The model of evolution would lead us to believe that people separated by oceans on different continents would have evolved much more specialized to their environment. And we would have more discrepancy or more differences in our DNA. But the evidence doesn't fit their model. It's not even close. That's why it's shocking and remarkable. Humanity does not look like what a product of evolution would be. We are too genetically similar to each other. You know, the, the term races isn't even a biblical term. It has no right in the biblical story. Okay, because it's an, it's, races is an evolutionary term. We're, we, we're really part of just one human race. There is no black, there is no white. We are really just all different shades of brown. That's all we are. Just different shades of brown. But despite this genetic evidence, secular scientists have long touted that studying science, studying nature, supports evolution, which is the underpinnings of atheism. But is it not logical church that studying the creation should point to a creator? That makes sense, doesn't it? If God does exist, like the Bible claims, then shouldn't creation only amplify his reality to us? According to the Bible, it does. Romans 1.20 reads, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Bible tells us that his majesty is so clear to us in the evidence of the world that all people are without excuse for denying God. So how do some scientists, certainly not all, but a lot in secular academia, use the study of nature to declare that there is no God, when God said looking at creation would only reveal him? This is a very important point right now, my friends. Because Dr. Scott Todd of Kansas State University explains how this is possible. He wrote, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Wow! Man has made the constructs of secular science to have a foundational bias against God. That is the starting point. This is called materialism. It's a philosophy. And what materialism means is that reality is restricted to what only man can see or prove. Since many people think of God as being a supernatural being that no one has ever seen before, then that means that God is not approachable through a materialistic worldview. So simply put, secular science, the constructs, the limitations they have put, in, they have put on it, means, uh, the limitations of materialism means materialism equals no God. That is why when data points to God, that data is ignored. The Bible says those people who ignore are without excuse. Now, another important point that I just, I've got to make is if you are ever speaking to an atheist or an unbeliever who just says, hey, if God would just show up and reveal himself, and I would believe in him. Well, that argument does not work for the Christian. Do you know why? Because our God is Jesus Christ, who was born 2,000 years ago and walked with man, and we have a written account of his existence. Materialism lands no blow against Jesus Christ. Now, when the data is ignored, that points to God, which they say they do, such scientific recklessness could lead to conclusions that are not just a little bit off, but exponentially off. Like perhaps the earth being millions and billions of years old when the Bible teaches that we're only thousands of years old. The, this picture has some rock formations on it. I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but there are definite lines in those rock formations. And we go out in nature, we can see all these lines, you know. 
A British man by the name of Charles Lyell in the 1830s popularized the idea that layers or strata are stacked slowly bit by bit, taking thousands, even millions of years to accumulate. It is a term called uniformitarianism. Now, there's no quiz later, so you don't have to remember that. But what that means is it states that geological processes happen very, very, very slowly over time. Now, this is him. It is critical to understand that Lyell stated that it was his goal to free the sciences from Moses. Well, Moses was the man that God used basically to write the book of Genesis, which is our history. Thus, Lyell wanted what? to free the sciences from God, to free the sciences from the Bible. He tried to accomplish this by claiming that the earth was much, much older than what was currently believed. Now, if you take this idea that geological layers take thousands and millions of years to, to accumulate, then what conclusion would you come up to when you looked at, say, all the strata of the Grand Canyon? And here it is, if you can see that. It's virtually impossible to count all, this, all the layers in the Grand Canyon. It's just too grand. So if someone believes that each one of those layers took a long, long time to form, then all of a sudden the Grand Canyon looks like it's millions and millions of years old. And there you have it. Genesis, which leads us to believe we're only thousands of years old, is no longer a reliable account, they say, because of the interpretation of what these rock layers mean. You see, understanding uniformitarianism is critical to understanding evolution, because Darwin and Lyell were very, very close friends. And Darwin used Lyell's idea of these long ages of millions and millions of years to give enough time for the theory of evolution to occur. See, Darwin's idea of slow, gradual evolution would have never have gotten off the ground if the earth was 6,000 years old, like the Bible said. He needed Lyell's millions and millions of years. This entire evolutionary worldview can be traced back, honestly, to just a few British men. So this is the time. Who do you trust? Who and what is your authority? Do we trust the Bible to give us an accurate account of history? Or do we trust these guys who wanted to free us from Moses and thought that Jesus Christ represented nothing more than a damnable doctrine? And what about Romans 1.20 that says the evidence of creation leaves us without excuse? It seems like the book of Romans claims that the evidence would support Genesis, not Lyell and Darwin. In May of 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted in the state of Washington. This was the most documented geological, one of the most documented geological events in history because the mountain was swelling beforehand so everyone knew it was going to blow. I mean, they were trying to evacuate people. And geologists came in, set up cameras and video, and they sat back and they watched when it erupted as nature gave the lesson. It was ge geologists didn't have to speculate on what happened. They were able to see it. Now, this cliff face was created at three different events stemming from Mount St. Helens. There's a person down here at the bottom for scale to give an idea. Now, the important, that highlighted middle section right up here is of particular importance to us. It's about 20 feet. Now, can you see all the layers in there? There's tons of layers in that 20 feet there. Well, uniformitarianism, we just can't, stumbled upon this thing, would tell us that that took just thousands and millions of years to form because of all those layers. Well, on June 12, 1980, that layer of more than 20 feet was deposited in just three hours. Three hours created all that. Uniformitarianism would tell us that would take many, many, many eons of time to create. Here's a magnified image of, of that center deposit. Now, there's a hand there, and it's, what it's showing is those little, tiny, even micro layers called varves. And those micro layers, almost paper-thin, wafer-thin layers, supposedly take one year each to form. One year each for the micro layers. Well, 20 feet of that stuff was laid down in three hours. The evidence does not fit the evolutionary assumption when you can see a process from start to finish. You don't have to speculate on the past. Also, laboratory experiments demonstrate that sediment that is circulated by air and water, when it settles, creates the same kind of microlayering, demonstrating again that when you see these kind of layers in nature, it doesn't mean thousands and millions of years. The evidence doesn't fit their model. All, this, all that happens here is when dirt and sediment are, are, is being circulated by water, 
it, it just tumbles over itself, segre segregates itself by size and weight. And it just, that's how it, it ends up layering. It's not, not that big of a deal. It's actually really easy to understand. Now, when you go out into the world and you see all these layers through the rock formations and stuff like that, what event in our biblical history could have caused so many layers throughout the world? Noah's flood. Noah's flood. Noah's flood would have churned up so much and circulated so much, been turbulent, that the earth would have just segregated itself as it, as it tumbled over things. And we have all the layers. Noah's flood is what explains our geology. Noah's flood is what explains all the layers. Noah's flood is what explains all the fossils that we find. Because all those fossils are, based, are animals that were killed and covered in water and mud and then permineralized and they became fossils. Noah's flood in the Bible explains why. But someone in here may ask me, someone in school, would say, wait a minute, Derek. We know rocks are millions and millions of years old because they've been scientifically tested in labs. You know, the laboratories come out and tell us how old they are. What about them? Well, without getting too deep into their data assumptions, which are many, let's just cut to the chase, shall we? What if we could test the test? Let's just see if the test is even remotely accurate. Well, in Creation Magazine, our flagship product, we reported that a 50-year-old volcanic rock was, was tested for its age. Now, how do we know it was 50 years old? It's because the molten lava it came from a volcanic eruption. The molten lava hardened. And at that point, when that lava becomes a hard rock, that's when the atomic clock, so to speak, begins ticking. All the laboratory tests only test from the point of that rock being hardened. Well, that rock that was 50 years old, we knew when it was formed, was tested by secular labs, and they provided an age of 1.35 million years old. The data was, they, they weren't just wrong. They were exponentially wrong. And it just wasn't one time. Eleven samples from rocks from around the world were gathered up when we knew the exact, we knew the age of these rocks. All of the answers on the radiometric testing came back to be hundreds of thousand years all the way up to millions and millions of years. They weren't just a little bit off. They were exponentially off. So we know the tests do not work. They're not testing the age. All they're testing, to speak to scientifically, is how many parent isotopes are in the rock and how many daughter isotopes are in the rock at that time. That's it. It's not a time, it's not a, a indicator of age. But why do scientists continue to hold on to flawed data? I mean, this stuff has been published, it's been reported. We're telling them, listen, those tests, they're not accurate. But they disregard the evidence. Why do they disregard the evidence? Because it points to a young earth and therefore God and designer. And what are materialists who believe in materialism forced to do when that happens? They ignore the data. Dr. Richard Lewinton, a Harvard geneticist, explains very clearly why secular science must side with things that they know are wrong. Did you hear me? He explains why they must side with things that they know are inaccurate. He wrote this, Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between the science and the supernatural. He goes on, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories. He goes on, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. There it is. Secular science in a nutshell right there, my friends. They have a prior faith and no God that determines how they view the evidence. Tonight in the Dinosaur Talk, we're going to get deep into that. And you're really going to be edified by what is said tonight. But even though, according to this, or even though their worldview is so easy to expose, and it is easy to expose, they're admitting they believe in patent absurdity. They're still very successful in convincing people that they are right when actually 
They say that they're not. And the way they do this, the number one tool used to deceive people about millions and millions of years are the dinosaurs. We are told dogmatically dinosaurs like this Pachycephalosaurus died out over 65 million years ago. And as I just said, tonight is an entire presentation just on the dinosaurs and how they fit into the biblical worldview and how they actually testify for the Bible and not evolution. And I hope everyone comes back tonight for that. It's an evidential approach that just will edify you and make you just even further believe in the strength that is our Bible. But for some of those, maybe you have a prior commitment and you can't make it tonight, I'm going to give you one piece of evidence, that just one, that shows that dinosaurs did not die out 65 million years ago. There was a, in Montana, a few years back, there was a T-Rex bone, Tyrannosaurus rex leg bone, that was excavated out. And it was so big that they couldn't get it out by helicopter. It was just huge. So the team actually sawed the thing in half, which is something that you never really do. You want to keep everything intact. Well, they sawed it in half to get it just to fly it out. And when they got it back to the laboratory, there were some special kind of unique things to this bone. Because one, it was bone and wasn't fossilized, which is interesting. Well, they decided to look at the interior of it, look at the bone underneath a microscope. And this is what they saw. The bone still contained dinosaur tissue, soft tissue, blood cells, protein fragments, collagen. In fact, when some of the tissue was stretched out, it snapped back. That's what this picture is on the side. It, was, it still had elasticity to it. Stretched out, snapped back to its original form. This thing set the evolutionary world and still on its head. Because there's no way this thing lasted 68 million years old. This kind of stuff can't last 68,000 years old. Flesh decomposes. Doesn't it? We all know that. This is hard evidence for our biblical worldview. But that is the catch. What happens when the evidence points to God? And you have a prior commitment to materialism. Secular science disregards the evidence. They are recruiting... PhD students to try to figure out why this lasted 68 million years. That is their starting presupposition. It's like, wow, how did that happen? Everything we know about rapid decomposition points to a young age on this creature. You don't need any fancy academic degrees. All you need is your common sense to go, that's not 68 million years old. The Lord gave you the ability to understand this at face value. Just use logic. The Bible says on day six all the land creatures were created. Dinosaurs are land creatures. On day six, Adam and Eve were also created. Therefore, what? Dinosaurs and man would have walked together side by side on this earth for a long time. This is evidence for that, which supports our Bible. Now, what I have presented today only skimmed the surface. And it's not enough to serve your church in reaching this community. This community is hurting, isn't it? This community has some darkness in it. You are the light. My talk isn't going to do it. All right? In, three week, in two weeks' time, you're only going to remember 10% of what I say. In three weeks' time, it will be 5% of what I say. In four weeks' time, you'll only remember if you liked me or not. Okay? That's how this works. That is not enough to equip you to, reach evangel to be evangelical and reach the lost around you. We all need to work daily on developing our biblical apologetic, our witness, our testimony. It needs to be on the tip of our tongue at all times. It needs to be a part of our lifestyle. We need to be diligent in learning more and more and more about God. First, because of your family. Your first mission field is to your family. And then also your neighbors, your unsaved neighbors. Because they are getting their worldview from very, very dangerous sources. I pulled this off of a Fox News uh, story this year. This stat. It says, according to Nielsen, the average American watches more than 143 hours of TV a month. Wow. That's American, not family, the average person. That's nearly five hours a day of secular inputs. Satan has created an environment that is an assault on our senses. He wants us ineffective obtuse. He wants us dazed and confused. He wants us incapable of critical thought. Kids out there are being raised by Hollywood, and then they're being told that evolution created them. And of course, 
they're being told they're nothing more than walking sacks of bone and water that were created accidentally by chance. And of course they can't refute it because their minds have been spun to mush by secular video. Satan is the deceiver of the entire world, isn't he? He has orchestrated a coup on our mind and, and has even managed to convince the world that the Christians are the dumb ones. It's the Christians that are stupid. It's the Christians who are stupid to actually believe God meant what he said in Genesis 1. We hear it all the time. Your pastor has heard it from other pastors in the area. That's what we're being told. That's not the truth. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. To know God and His majesty and to humble yourself before Him is the beginning of understanding. It is the beginning of knowledge. In Christ alone are the answers to the most important questions about life. But even though we have the answers available to us, we must commit to study them. Mark 12.30 says, Now shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commitment, commandment. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our mind. The Christian should be diligent to have a keenly prepared mind and testimony. When someone comes into these church doors, I believe this fully, they have come to the place where the answers are. Christ is the enlightenment. The house of the Lord is the place of instruction. It is the place for answers. Our mandate is to be the spiritual and intellectual hub of the community. Yes, you go to school, you go to college, you, you do that to get a career, to find a way to make a living, but you come to church to find out how to live life. This is where all the answers are in church. For over 30 years, our ministry has been going. And Creation Magazine has equipped families just like you to, to, into this discipline of studying so that you can protect your family and then reach the lost. We refute the secular claims. We refute the secular claims of evolution. And we put it in this magazine. Four times a year, this magazine comes out, and we put everything that we've got into it, page after page after page, that demonstrate that the God of the Bible is the only explanation to the natural world around us. This magazine is our number one tool because it's written for laymen. Some of the books back there, I mean, they're all excellent, but some of them can get a little technical. That magazine is for a family, and, and that's what we try to make it into. Everyone has a children's section in it, but it's for a family. Now, in just a moment, we're going to pass this around. This just helps me in the back for time. But you'll see a, a form that if you want to sign up for the magazine, this is how you do it. It's a form with two parts. On the left-hand side, that there, there's an address and contact information. You'll want to fill those fields in if you want a subscription. All right. Then you'll want to check which subscription you want. Once a one-year subscription subscription is twenty-five dollars. You get a magazine to take home with you right now, and four more are sent to you. If you want three-year subscription, you get that magazine to go home and any DVD you want. Pick whichever one you want. Now, what you do is after you fill that out, fill out both sides. There's a coupon on the right of that form. You tear that coupon off and you bring that to me, to the back, and then we just do it back there. Now, if you can go ahead and circulate that, that would be wonderful. Now, as that is circulating, because there's probably a lot of books back there you've never even seen before, perhaps, I'm just going to explain what they are real, real quick. The red book is the answers book. We've had over, actually, it's right here. Over the last 30 years of ministry, we've received 60 of the most asked questions that we've gotten through the, to the ministry, and we've all answered them in this book. So it's a very, very good, broad book. Now, I'm going to, we're going to do this because I want to give this at 50% off to anyone that wants it. Just so, try to get things that are, you know, lower the price range. So this is only $7 today. That is just, it's a wonderful book. Um, this, the other book up here is called Refuting Evolution in the middle. That was written by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, one of the most brilliant men I've ever met in my life. And we are so thankful he's on our side. <laughs> okay. What he has done is he has just refuted what is being taught in high schools about evolution. Line by line, just it just completely refutes it, bit by bit. If you have grandchildren or children that are going through school, this book can help them and equip them to withstand the secular attacks. Um, genetic Entropy is back there. What this book does is it is written by a, a PhD professor, a brilliant, brilliant man, and he shows that all of our mutations that are happening in our body, every time reproduction occurs, there's mutations, and they're damaging our genome. Mutations are actually, it's the opposite of evolution that's occurring. We are breaking down. We are seeing more diseases today. 
We're seeing more birth defects today. That's because the mutations are, are compounding. They're compounding. It's the opposite of evolution. It is a wonderful, wonderful book to show that, you know, what is happening in our DNA is not evolution at all, but it supports the biblical worldview perfectly. Alien intrusion. This is going to sound crazy to you, and it is, but it's important. Aliens are not real, okay? I want to say that first, but evolutionists are starting to believe that they are. See, evolutionists are starting to be pushed into a corner because we, the more and more and more we see about our cells and the, just the complexity of our human body in the simple cell is that there is no such thing as a simple cell. They're amazing. They're remarkably designed. We can't even fathom all the detail put into one tiny little cell. Now, evolution for years has said that a cell accidentally formed itself. Well, that's an absurd comment. It's an absurd to belief to believe that. So, they're being forced to reconcile, or pretty much recognize that something did create them. So they're going, intelligent designer or God? Or basically, what was their intelligent designer? And they're doing aliens. They're believing aliens came and created us. Extinction of Evolution, that was my first book. We talked about that. Dragons or Dinosaurs, I'm doing an entire presentation on that tonight. My friends... You have done absolutely fantastic in, in staying with me. I know there's, people have been tired, and it's a lot of, lot of information. But thank you so much. Um, everything in the back will help you. I'll answer questions in the back. Thank you for your time. God bless you. Brother Isaac, thank you very much for that presentation. I don't know if you noticed it, but there were like a hundred different scriptures that he tied in with this issue, both Old Testament and New Testament. It is so essential for Christians to understand that our worldview is based on not just one or two verses out of Genesis 1 through 3. We find the creation is mentioned over and over again, all the way through scripture. Our Lord Jesus Christ emphasized creation and the the fact that there was one man, Adam, and one woman, Eve, the Apostle Paul, as he pointed out here on the screen, tells us that as by one man, sin entered into the world, and so death by sin, the scripture has creation as its foundation. We must not forget that. And we are in a, a vicious war that is attacking our Lord Jesus Christ, who will win. But if we are not faithful in the battle, we will suffer the consequences for deciding to stand on the sidelines. Very serious. At the end, he mentioned the issue of aliens and UFOs. And, of course, the evolutionists believe a thing called panspermia. In fact, not too long ago, I saw a video called uh, Mission to Mars. It's supposed to be an action video. You know what the whole bottom line of that video was? You get it in the last five minutes of the video is panspermia, that aliens somehow planted the seeds of life here on our planet and it developed into what we have now. You see, the evolutionists don't have enough evidence to say evolution started here. They don't have enough time to say it started here. So they're trying to push it out into outer space somewhere where it must have taken place because the creationists can't test that just like they can't either. They just offer it and people believe it. We are surrounded by demonism when we're looking at stuff like that. I know that's a strong statement, but that is what is taking place. Satan is the great deceiver, and he will do anything he can to get you from trusting in the living God who made you and from realizing your accountability and responsibility before him. Dear people, this is an important message, not just for you to believe it, but for you to pass it to your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, the resources that are available will help you to do that where you won't forget what you've heard. Our closing hymn this evening or this morning is in your insert, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. We worship the Creator God, the one who is the King of Heaven. Let's stand to sing that one that you find in your orange insert, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. We'll stand to sing. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to His feet thy tribute bring, ransom He'll restore forgiven, for like me His praise should sing.
able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power now and ever Amen <laughs> 